Hi, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jimmy Connor, and I'm with Floor Street Capital, which is a corporate access firm based in the city of Toronto. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Randy Smallwood. Randy is the president and CEO of Wheaton Precious Metals. But before Randy begins his presentation, I'm gonna say a few words. Wheaton Precious Metal trades on the New York Stock Exchange and the Toronto Stock Exchange under the symbol of WPM. It has a market cap of $20 billion US, $30 billion Canadian. It has 450 million shares outstanding, fully diluted, and it pays a quarterly dividend of 10 cents per share or 40 cents annually. And with that, I'm going to hand things over to Randy. Randy, thank you very much for joining us today. Before you begin your formal presentation, why don't you give us a little bit of background on yourself and also how you became involved in Wheaton Precious? Yeah, thanks, Jimmy, and uh, always a pleasure to uh, to work with you and uh, in, in sharing our story. Uh, my name is Randy Smallwood, President and Chief Executive Officer of Wheaton Precious Metals. I've been with the company since we founded this company back in 2004 when we created the streaming business model. Uh, I'm a geological engineer by background. I used to work for Gold Corp and in fact uh, was, was looking to raise capital for Gold Corp uh, in, in being part of the team that founded uh, the original Silver Wheaton back in 2004. Uh, 2007 swung over to this company on a full-time basis um, and, uh, and and then took over as the CEO in 2011. There will be, of course, some forward-looking statements in this uh, presentation. I urge everyone to understand the risks associated with those forward-looking statements, uh, some of which are described in the fine print here. Uh, I'm going to start off with a description of who Wheaton Precious Metals is. Um, Wheaton Precious Metals, of course, as I mentioned, we created the streaming business model, which is uh, clearly a model that is designed to benefit all stakeholders. Our vision here at Wheaton is to be the world's premier precious metals investment vehicle. And uh, our mandate uh, in, 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 in achieving and striving for that vision is to deliver value through that streaming model all to all of our stakeholders. And that includes our shareholders. First and foremost, that's who I work for directly. And uh, we're, we're constantly looking to deliver profitable precious metals production, a long-term and high margin precious metals production with a relatively low risk profile attached to that production. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very different offering than traditional mining companies and for that matter, traditional bullion uh, buying. To our partners, the operators that, uh, that, that we work with, uh, where we uh, help them crystallize, typically the, the crystallize the value of a non-core portion of their uh, of their our production stream. Generally, these are base metal companies that um, that that uh, that have precious metals byproduct, and we uh, we find a way to to give them the value for that precious metals byproduct and bring that into our portfolio. But we also work with our partners past the original upfront payment to to uh, purchase the uh, stream, uh, in the sense that we have technical ambassador programs, and we also have a very strong ESG program that provides uh, um, parallel support with our operators in terms of uh, strengthening social license within the local communities, looking for sustainability initiatives and such like that. And that really is our third group of stakeholders, which is our neighbors. That is the neighbors that are around us and our employees in this company, but also the neighbors that, uh, that, that are living around the mine sites that deliver us our metal. Even though we don't operate these mines, uh, that doesn't absolve us of the responsibility of making sure that we leave sustainable benefits to the communities that are most impacted, most benefited from this mine, and deliver those back. And so we provide support by working with our share, with our sorry, with our partners, in in improving and strengthening their social license. The streaming advantage, really, it's high upside with much lower risks than what you see in the precious metals sphere. Uh, because of the streaming model, we have commodity price leverage. We have a base price that we pay on a per ounce basis, but that still delivers consistently good, strong margins. However, that does give us leverage over our own in bullion. We do get the expiration upside. These are life of mine agreements where we get a percentage of whatever metal is produced from these mine sites. And, uh, and so any expiration success or expansion potential all comes into play through that. Optionality, we have a number of projects that still aren't delivering metal to us, but will sometime in the future and, uh, and uh, delivers uh, some really good upside from that perspective. The huge advantage of the streaming model compared to a traditional mining investment is our predictable costs. 
the fact that our capital costs are described or are fixed in the original upfront payment and our operating costs are also fixed in the contract as typically either a fixed amount on a per ounce basis or a fixed percentage of the spot price. Um, but the fact that we don't have that cost risk dramatically lowers the risk profile for, for traditional uh, precious metals investors. Tax confidence. Uh, we, we spent a lengthy time uh, going through an audit and a reassessment uh, uh, and successfully defended our business model here in Canada through an agreement with the Canada Revenue Agency, which, which is much different than a court victory. We sat down, the CRA went through our business model and is very comfortable with what we're doing now and has signed off and agreed in terms of our business model. So tax confidence in terms of how our business is structured. Sustainable dividend, our dividend is a function of our cash flows and so it therefore is attached to uh, our, our production growth and our, and our commodity price and, uh, and so good strong sustainable dividend and a high quality asset portfolio. It's been an interesting year, uh, obviously this virtual world, I'd, I'd much rather be doing this face to face with everyone but unfortunately that's not possible in today's world, uh, but we have been busy. Uh, earlier, uh, about a month ago, we announced, uh, or close to a month ago, we announced the intent to list on the London Stock Exchange. This is uh, a way of uh, expanding our, you know, as I say, another step in our, uh, our desire to be a global solution to stream finance and to, and to precious metals investing. And, and really, the London Stock Exchange, we're not raising capital there. This is really about expanding our, our potential shareholder base and providing options uh, into, into the streaming model into our company as, a, as, as, a, as an investable way to, to get into precious metals. We published our inaugural sustainability report uh, and uh, earlier on this year. Um, obviously, we've made great progress in improving um, um, the disclosure around our sustainability initi initiatives and our, our, our ESG initiatives. What we have seen is, is good recognition from a number of the different indices and in fact, uh, uh, just been included into the uh, Euronext Vigio World 120 Index, uh, Sustainability Index. We did announce a stream earlier on, we're still crossing T's and dotting I's on it with uh, Call This Gold, it's the Marmato project down in Colombia. It's a relatively small deal, but $110 million total uh, for 6.5% of the gold and 100% of the silver. This is an asset that uh, currently isn't producing very much, but they've had incredible exploration success and are looking to use this capital to construct a new facility for some deeper, uh, much much more higher higher grade and more consistent mineralization and more massive mineralization that they've found at depth. And so a pretty exciting project to be associated with. And of course, earlier this, uh, this year, about a month ago, uh, I took over as the uh, chairman of the World Gold Council. I'm um, very proud. Uh, I don't think there's a better advocacy group for gold in this uh, in this world. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, one of the one of the areas that we've been improving um, transparency and, and credibility of gold is responsible gold mining principles, which were brought in, and all members are working their way towards complying with these principles to ensure that we have transparent and and, and strong. Um, um, gold production standards that are uh, give confidence to to gold investors. Randy, I'm just curious about your, if you don't mind going back to that last slide, but uh, the London Stock Exchange, what percent of your shareholders are out of Europe? What percent would be from North America? And are you getting a lot more calls from the European generalist? Yeah, so currently uh, about 70% of our stock trades in the New York Stock Exchange, the other 30% trades in the Toronto Stock Exchange. But uh, from an investor base, about 15% of our holdings are, are over in Europe, um, mostly UK based, but we definitely do have some holdings, uh, some strong shareholders on the continent in Europe. Um, you know, what, what we've seen is a lot of interest uh, for the last, ever since we made the announcement, uh, I've been, I mean, our, our head offices are here in Vancouver on the west coast of North America, and, and I've been working London hours of late. We've been up early uh, dealing with uh, educating new funds and new faces that have a lot of interest. The London Stock Exchange has never had a substantive streaming company and in fact has very limited options with respect to investing into precious metals, period. And so um, there's a lot of interest in London. Um, we feel there's about uh, three to 400 billion worth of assets under management that has restrictions with respect to investing outside of the UK. And so we, uh, we feel that we pr should provide an option for those funds 
to, uh, to, to bring in some precious metals exposure. And uh, you know, around the world, we're seeing a real strong shift in a lot of the generalist funds around the world to have five to 10% of their holdings in, in precious metals exposure, just to provide some stability in this, uh, this such a volatile world. And so, so we're hoping to provide that avenue. I think the intent is to just expand our potential uh, shareholder base, and that can only deliver positives to our existing shareholders. And Randy, just a quick question on Caldas Gold. Uh, that's a relatively small deal for you. What mm -hmm. was it about that asset that was so attractive? I think it's the expiration potential. Um, you know, and I've seen similar style deposits down in uh, down in South America in that region. Uh, in fact, in Colombia, had some experience. Uh, we were uh, an investor in Ventana. And, uh, and what we've seen is these EPO slash mesothermal type deposits, where as you dive deeper, these systems, these uh, broad epithermal veins all over the place seem to coalesce into one or uh, several discrete units that have good continuity and excellent grades and excellent thicknesses. And this is what it sure looks like they've uncovered at, uh, at Caldas or at the Marmado project is, is, is some good, strong continuity, some, some very, very robust numbers, and it's totally open. They're still having exploration success there as they work their way towards getting uh, another mill built and new uh, access infrastructure to uh, move this forward. So it just looks like an exciting project that will be delivering value for quite a while. This, uh, this slide shows our, our portfolio of assets. As you can see, we currently have 20 mines delivering us metal right now, another nine development projects. A real strong America's focus. Um, some of that comes from our history as a silver focus company originally, where Mexico and Peru were very important to us, uh, being big silver producing countries. But um, you know, we definitely have expanded our, our reach then, since then and, and are now actually generating more revenue from gold than we are from silver. Um, but the America's centric political risk is something that's very important to us. And so it does limit uh, some of the other parts of the world. That doesn't stop us from, from looking in Africa, looking in, in Asia, looking in, in Australia. Um, but we just haven't, uh, haven't closed any transactions there. We'll still continue to explore these areas and, and truly build ourselves up as a global uh, company in terms of delivering finance to, uh, to mining companies. As I mentioned, nine development projects, uh, um, they also provide good optionality to, uh, to continue uh, growing our company. What I like highlighting on this slide also is the list of partners that we have down the right-hand side of this slide. And you can see that the streaming business model works for everyone in the mining industry, from the large diversified companies like Vale and Glencore, and Newmont and Barrick as, as large gold companies, all the way down to the single asset developers like Alexco, Goldex, Pinoro, Cucho Copper. Streaming works as a source of finance, a source of capital for the entire mining industry. Bodes very well for us on a go-forward basis. We constantly, we're, we're blessed with an industry that always needs capital and, uh, and, and the streaming model delivers a competitive source of capital to the entire spectrum of the industry. And Randy, of those nine development projects, which ones are closest to production and are there any that re you're really excited about? Uh, yeah, the uh, the Rosemont project uh, just in Arizona, uh, owned by HUD Bay. Um, it's it, it had its permit about a year and a half ago and then there was an appeal uh, launched by one of the NGO groups and, uh, and so there's a decision that's being uh, uh, run through a, a another appeal process and, and taken up to a higher level. Um, they're hopeful to, to be reestablishing that permit within a couple of years and commence construction. It's a, it's an, it's a, it's a very strong copper asset that, uh, that has healthy silver and, and uh, gold uh, byproduct. Our stream pays about 200, you know, we pay about $230 million. We pay $230 million to get 100% of the silver and 100% of the gold. It'll deliver uh, between 50 and 60,000 gold equivalent ounces per year to our credit. So it's a very attractive deal for us. Uh, it'll be about a two and a half to three year build. They haven't got a firm timeline. All the, obviously they have to reestablish their permits and move forward. But uh, that one I find is uh, pretty exciting and, and could, could easily come into production within five, six years uh, if everything sort of lines up. Uh, Pasco Lama, of course, the largest of those development uh, opportunities. Barrick, uh, Mark Bristow is spending a lot of time uh, focusing on trying to reestablish social license down in Chile and trying to get this project back onto the uh, development plate. And so we're patiently waiting. It's a, it's a very attractive project for us and, uh, and it would deliver about 9 million 
um, silver ounces per year to us over the first five years based on their original plan. And so uh, it would be a nice substantive addition. And then, of course, Navidad down in Argentina, Pan American Silver continues to move that forward. Michael Steinman and his team have done uh, good jobs in terms of building relationships both within at the federal and the provincial level in Argentina. And so those three projects uh, look pretty promising. Toro Peru has also had some success. Uh, Goldex uh, continues to move forward and, uh, and uh, it, it could be a sleeper in this, uh, in this package. I think if there's a slide that differentiates us from our peers, this is this is probably the one that does the best job of it in terms of uh, the quality of our assets. And I mentioned earlier on, um, you know, we do really focus on quality investments. And, and the first way we measure quality is through um, the cost profile. Where does the asset sit on its respective cost curve? So that's to say that if I'm taking gold from a copper mine, where does that copper mine fit on the worldwide copper cost curve? we're only interested in the assets in the bottom half of that respective cost curve. We're not really interested in the, uh, in the higher cost assets. And as you can see, with 20 mines delivering us metal right now, 88% of our production comes from the bottom half of the respective cost curve. In fact, the bulk of that, 73%, comes from the bottom quartile. These are truly world-class, high-margin mines, not only for us, but also for our partners, for our operators. And that's very important because that, that means it's the first place that our operators, our partners, will continue to reinvest and grow and explore and expand. It's the area that delivers them the best return on their invested capital also. So it's a very important aspect. And I would challenge any precious metals company to compare, to compete with these kind of uh, numbers from a quality perspective. Especially when you add in also the mine life, we've got over 30 years of reserves, another seven years of measured and indicated resources, and another 26 years of inferred resources in front of us. Altogether, a very, very long life portfolio that has high operating margins will be delivering us and our shareholders metal for a very, very long time. Brandy, just a couple of questions here. How many deals do you typically look at in any given year? And what's the number one criteria you look at when deciding if you are going ahead with a proposal? Um, we typically look at probably 20, I, I would say we, we probably uh, uh, outside look at over 50, but uh, I would say probably about 15 to 20 of them get to the point of a data room review. And in a normal year, when you do site visits, we'd probably get to about five or six site visits and we'd be successful on one or two of those. So that's probably about the ratio that I would, uh, the, that I would explain out. The criteria, the number one criteria is where does this asset fall on the on the respective cost curve? We, as I said, we are only interested in assets in the first uh, first or second quartiles of the respective cost curve. If they're higher than that, we'll put stink bids in. But if we ever make some investments in that space, it'll be for a very good rate of return that reflects the risk. Our real focus is on the first and second quartile of the respective cost curves. And so that's the number one criteria uh, of any investment that we make. Just one more question. Do the type of deals you look at differ depending on where we are in the commodity cycle? And if so, how? Um, it's not so much that, it's how much we're willing to pay. So it doesn't really change the type of deal that we're looking for, but it's it's what kind of a long-term commodity price do we use when we value the asset? And what I can tell you is that when we feel we're closer near the bottom of the commodity price cycle, we use a long-term number that's pretty close to the spot price at that time. But when we see prices climbing and, and moving up, and, and by, by all means, I, I don't see gold at a high right now. I see still lots of opportunity for it to continue climbing. When I look around the world, it's pretty tough to see any substance behind our argument of us being at a top in gold. There's still lots of space. But as it climbs up, we, we wind up uh, dropping down our long-term uh, commodity price assumptions relative to where the spot price is. So it's a, it's a lesser percentage. And what that means is that we're not gonna pay as much on a per ounce basis relative to spot price on the sides or near the top of the commodity price cycle. And I think what this naturally does is stops us from buying in the top part of the, of the price cycle. That's a very important aspect. We, we work in a business that, uh, that, that has to deal with cyclical commodity pricing, which means there's times to buy and there's times not to buy. And by uh, just by nature of the way that we invest, when prices are really high, I would, I would say the market is relatively frothy and there's lots of capital coming into the market. That's not the time for us to be investing. Now, we still put out proposals, but our cost of capital um, by design 
is higher than a lot of the other opportunities out there and we wind up not making acquisitions during those stages of high commodity prices that's that allows us to build the war chest and wait for it lower so we are not a deal machine we don't just constantly try and deliver deals we only want to deliver deals when the timing is right from the commodity price cycle perspective this slide, uh, slide number nine, talks about our production profile. Um, we did have an impact from uh, this pandemic early on, had some suspensions, six different assets had to shut down for about a two month period on average. Uh, we did release updated guidance in August at the, uh, with our Q2 results uh, that dropped our production down to 670,000 uh, gold equivalent ounces. It, it was originally uh, estimated to be around 705,000 gold equivalent ounces. So it was about a 5% drop. Um, but what's particularly exciting on this slide is the fact that our five-year average is still going to stay at 750,000 gold equivalent ounces, which means we've got some substantive organic growth coming down the pipe over the next few years. And, and it is a good, strong organic growth profile that I think is actually a relatively conservative estimate. Um, let's start off with Penasquito, where we're seeing the highest grades that that mine has ever, uh, that deposit owned, it has. And we're going to see that for probably the next three or four years, the highest silver and gold grades, uh, gold obviously, and 75% of the silver to Newmont's credit, but we get 25% of whatever silver comes out of Penasquito. So we are already seeing higher grades than we've ever seen from this, uh, from this uh, operation. And we're also seeing it benefits of improved recovery rates as Newmont goes in and fine tunes, fine -tunes that operation. We're also seeing uh, growth at um, the Stillwater mine a continued effort in terms of trying to improve uh, um, fill the mill campaign. What they've got is infrastructure there that isn't being fully utilized. And so they're trying to expand the number of working faces to deliver more material to the mill. It's a long-term program that'll be delivering extra benefits to us over the next two or three years. It's actually, I think their schedule is about 18 months to try and get to full capacity at these mills. So uh, we should see some continued improvements at the Stillwater operations. The Constancia mine down in Peru, Papa Concha zone is coming on. It's a high grade satellite zone that'll be delivering upwards of 30,000 extra ounces of gold to us every year, uh, over and above what Constancia normally delivers. So we'll see some good, uh, that's expected to turn on the switches in the first quarter of next year. So we'll see some good increase in precious metals production out of uh, Constancia. Of course, we start receiving cobalt from Voices Bay starting in January 1st next year. That'll add about 2% to our 2 to 2.5% 2 to our revenue stream. So it's the equivalent of about 15,000 gold equivalent ounces uh, uh, coming on stream starting in January 1st of next year. Perhaps the most exciting out of all of these, though, is the Salobo mine, which is, uh, which is our key asset, our flagship asset, owned and operated by Vale down in Brazil. Uh, last year, it delivered 278,000 gold ounces to us. Um, it's, it's an incredible asset that has all sorts of potential. And Vale recognizes that, again, because this is a first quartile producer. It's very profitable for Vale. It's very profitable for us. Vale has been drilling on this project for the last three to four years and filling, uh, filling in uh, increasing confidence levels within the uh, within the existing pit, but also expanding the depths of the pit. The previous design pit was down to the bottom of the block model, so it was data limited. They've uh, gone a long ways towards uh, improving, expanding that database. That block model now goes 250 meters deeper than it was originally. And so Vale is in the process of redoing the mine plan, which is important because they're also uh, substantively through um, uh, a third phase of expansion down there that'll take the daily processing rate from 60,000 tons per day to 90,000 tons per day. So a 50% increase in throughput capacity. Now they expect to turn the switches on on that expansion sometime in 2022. And, uh, and we should see some substantive increase in gold production. They haven't released their updated mining plan yet. So we took a conservative approach where we assumed that they would process all the ore through the mill, which meant that it was only gonna be a bump of about 30 to 40,000 gold ounces per year with this 50% increase. We don't think they're going to do that, we, but remains to be seen. We think they're gonna continue stockpiling low grade material and process the higher grade material. And if they do that, this 750,000 gold equivalent ounces will be increased by perhaps as much as 50 to 70,000 more ounces per year from this Lobo operation starting in 2022. So we could easily see ourselves on a path of well over 800,000 gold equivalent ounces in production before the end of this five year period.
of, of course, all sorts of other growth from uh, assets like um, um, San Damas, First Majestic continues to improve and expand this. They're opening up areas that were closed by the previous operator. They're expanding the mill capacity and improving uh, recoveries with replacing some of the uh, some of the milling to get finer grinds. Um, constant reinvestment, in, reinvestment into these assets. That's what happens when you have high margin assets as your partners want to continue reinvesting and improving these assets. So it's a good, strong production profile. Very good. So Randy, I got a couple of questions here on silver. First of all, just given your background, your view mm -hmm. on silver pricing and also silver sensitivities and what does the move in silver mean to your bottom line if silver goes from 30 to 40 to 50 bucks an ounce? Well, the beauty of our streaming model is that that's a very easy calculation. 80% um, of our revenue or of our production comes from fixed cost contracts, which means currently I think we're about $4. And in fact, I think the next slide uh, does highlight that. You can see current costs are about $5 per ounce of silver and about $421 per ounce of gold. Um, that doesn't change when the spot price climbs. So what happens is when we see silver climbing to buy, buy $5 an ounce, as you said, that $5 comes right back to our shareholders. So, you know, taking current prices of uh, call it $25 and a $5 cost at $20, that $5 will make our margins now $25 at $5 gain. It's a very easy model to calculate sensitivities because our costs are fixed and predictable. Now, about 20% of our contracts have a, a, a production payment that's a function, about 20% of the spot price. That means that we have a fixed margin on those ounces of 80%. So for 20% of our production, we have a fixed margin of 80%. And for the other 80% of our production, we have fixed prices that are uh, a little bit over $400 per ounce of gold and a little bit over $5 per ounce of silver. So good, healthy response. And, and that is one of the beauties is, is that in the streaming model, our, uh, you know, our, our return of price exposure back to our shareholders is compounded over what a traditional mining company has, mainly because our costs stay the same. Our costs don't climb with those higher prices, which is something you see the mining industry suffers from on a regular basis. And so good, strong returns on that. My, my, my feelings on silver, um, and I'll just whip back one slide. Um, as you can see, gold, we're now producing about 60% of our revenue from gold and about uh, 35, 30 to 35% of our revenue from silver. I will highlight that the optionality that we have at Rosemont and at uh, Pasqualama and at Navidad is very silver focused. There's a little bit of gold at Rosemont, but Navidad and, and Pasqualama are silver focused. So those would deliver strong silver production to us. But our challenge is finding good silver investments, which bodes well in my eyes, to the price of silver. And, and if you ask me, I'm actually more bullish on silver prices than I am on, on gold prices, mainly because there's some extra fundamentals behind silver that provide additional support for pricing. Continuing growth in industrial applications. Uh, and we've hit, hit peak silver production. The bulk of silver is produced from lead zinc mines, and there hasn't been any substantive lead zinc growth over the last few years but i've seen several mines shutting down and slowing down in production and so so it's just we've hit peak silver production already so what we have is increasing industrial demand we've already seen a decline in silver production on a worldwide basis and now we have sparked interest from investors which always lags gold but as as we know silver has dramatically outperformed gold over the last uh, three four months took gold a long ways to get to where it is. Silver <laughs> did it in about a month and a half. And so, so you know, very bullish on silver. Um, silver has always got higher volatility and so it always outperforms. We have to caution everyone. I mean, you know, higher beta goes in both directions, but uh, right now, very, very bullish on silver. I just wish we had some silver opportunities. If I look at our current corporate development portfolio, probably about 60 to 70% of it is gold focused and the rest of it is uh, there's probably another 10 or 15 that is uh, gold and silver combined and then there's a couple of silver projects and that's it so a couple more related questions to silver is silver disconnecting from the monetary metal and becoming more industrial and has the historic silver gold ratio that a lot of people talk about is it becoming more irrelevant because of this um, I don't think it is becoming irrelevant, but um, you know, I think it's always a good indication of how measuring how, how things are relative to history, but there's no real 
sound financial uh, relationship there that, that that you can stand behind. But you know what I what I will say is that um, silver it always it always has its core investors, but then in in times of um, uh, in challenging times, in times of distress, in times of concern about uh, uh, where people are looking for a store of value, silver has a a market that sort of steps in. So I, I can't. Uh, the increasing industrial demand is only a positive. I don't think there's any change on the on the supply side or sorry on the investment side. Um, but what if you go back and look at every bull run in precious metals, gold always started well ahead of silver. And it's like all of a sudden there's a there's a retail side that just has to wake up and 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 silver takes its run at that point. And I and I think that that's what we've started to see here over the last while is that um, as the retail side has steps back into and, and the general side steps back into the precious metal space, that's when silver wakes up and starts to go for a run. And again, the fundamentals behind it, the increasing industrial demand, um, and and the and the shortage of supply. The shrinking supply of of silver from mines, uh, all of that combined, um, you know, as as that retail, as that uh, generalist investor steps back into the silver space, it will outperform. I already showed this slide, slide ten, but it is worth reinforcing the healthy margins that we have and the fact that our costs are fixed by the contracts and predictable. The mining industry suffers from costs climbing as commodity prices climb um because there's a real drive towards you know high grade waste becoming low grade ore and being processed as as prices climb commodity prices climb you don't see that here our costs on a per ounce basis are fixed by the contracts and defined by the contracts and so if there's anything that differentiates us from from the traditional mining companies this is it the confidence that you have on our uh, on our operating costs and on our strong and healthy margins and Randy, I just want to clarify one thing. If when I look at 2019, the silver price, for example, it doesn't matter if silver is 30, 40, or 50 bucks an ounce, your cost is five dollars and two cents an ounce. For for 80 percent of our production, we do have the Antamina mine, which delivers us silver, and for that mine, we pay a production payment that is 20 percent of the spot price. And so our spot prices will climb by uh, by 20% of whatever that change is. And so there will be a slight increase, but that's only for 20% of our production, which is in this case, the Antimina operation. So massive upside with, Very. The, with the move in silver. All, all we have to do is go back and look at the 2010 to 2013 period. The last time we had a bull cycle, our company generated well over $2 billion in excess cash flow that wasn't expected because of that run in, uh, in precious metal prices. I know sometime over the next 60 years of reserves and resources, we're going to have a few more runs like that, and we're producing a lot more metal than we were back in 2010 to 2013. Our balance sheet is strong. Um, now, we are a bit unique again in the mining space, and especially in the streaming and royalty space, because we're comfortable with debt. Our risk profile is so low that the syndicate of banks from North America, from Europe, and from Japan uh, offer us $2 billion revolver at very attractive interest rates. Currently, it's just over 1.6%, 1.6%. And so um, given that, we find the best way to fund our transactions and acquisitions. And, and keep in mind that our cash flows are very, very consistent. Currently, we're generating well over $200 million per quarter in operating cash flows. Very, very consistent cash flows, but our acquis acquisition schedule is very lumpy. In 2018, we spent close to a billion dollars on new acquisitions. 2019, we didn't do any transactions. 2020, we've already announced the uh, the Marmato with uh, Caldas, 110 million, and hopeful to close a few more. But what this revolver allows us to do is minimize the dilution that our shareholders have to suffer through. We use the debt effectively, and so our net debt, as as of the end of the uh, second quarter, which was back in August, was just over 500 million dollars. If we don't spend any money on any new acquisitions over the next few months, that debt is going to be gone by the first quarter of next year. Um, now that is is obviously, uh, you know, um, I, I would much rather be putting money to work in the ground. And so we're constantly looking for new opportunities and we have plenty of capacity to do that. Um, but you can see with strong cash flows, as I said, well over 200 million per quarter right now, uh, we are in uh, the best shape we've ever been. We have 
we do have a pretty active corporate development portfolio right now. We're looking at a number of opportunities, uh, some as big as a billion dollars. There's several of them that are that big. And so hopefully we can move these projects forward and, and keep on putting our money to work in the ground. Uh, I will say that if it doesn't go into the ground, we build up a bit of a war chest, but then we look at increasing the dividend. And so uh, there's, there's more talk on the dividend a bit later on in this presentation. First of all, with the revolver, remind me again, what interest rate are you paying on that? I think it's about 1.67% right now or 1.65, somewhere in there. Yeah. So very cheap money. Yes. And another question, earlier this year, you announced an ATM or at the market program. Uh, have you used it yet? And under what circumstances will you use the ATM to raise equity or raise cash? Jimmy, that's a, a, a thanks for reminding me because I, I quite often forget we even have this ATM in place. And I'm proud of the fact that we are the only mining resource company that has an ATM in place and hasn't exercised it and hasn't diluted their, their current shareholders, which is who we work for. Um, we put the ATM in place because we've got a number of large scale opportunities out there. And if we're successful on a couple of these larger ones, we may need to tap into the equity side as opposed to keep on amping up. Obviously, we've got a $2 billion revolver. As of the end of June, we had one and a half billion in capacity on that. As I mentioned, we do have a couple of deals that we're looking at that are in the billion dollar range. And so if we were fortunate enough to close a couple of these things, we would have to look at that. And that's what the ATM is there for. It will not get used unless we exhaust our debt capacity. And, uh, and we have plenty of capacity beyond the $2 billion, but we're comfortable. We respect the fact that uh, shareholders start getting nervous if we start uh, getting too high on the debt. And so uh, I'm proud of the fact that in the last eight years, we have spent close to $7 billion in acquisitions. And we have only had to raise one and a half billion through equity financings. The rest of it all come, came from effectively using this revolver to smooth out the differential between our, our strong cash flows and those, uh, those acquisitions. Uh, that has saved, by our calculations, that has saved our shareholders, our current shareholders, about a 16% dilution. If we had used equity to fund all that growth, we would have 16% more shares issued outstanding right now. Our debt disappears by, by next year. So our shareholders are 16% richer because of this approach. As I mentioned earlier on, the excess cash flow that we generate, this is really what we set ourselves up for, is when we have these bull runs in commodity prices, uh, as long as we have good, strong production delivering all the way through, um, we build up the war chest. And that's when we start uh, looking at how do we, if we can't put the money into the ground, then we look at giving it back to our shareholders. And that's, that's where the dividend policy comes into place. We kicked off the, the current dividend policy back in that period to start returning cash to shareholders. We've since increased it and uh, good, strong production. But really, the fact that we're producing more than twice the metal we were back in that period, uh, you can imagine the cash flow generation possibility that we have in this company. So, Randy, a general question here. The average dividend on the S&P 500 is 2%, but with gold stocks, it's less than 1%. Given the cash flow that a lot of producers and royalty and streaming companies are throwing off, when will this change? Um, well, I think that what we've seen is uh, dividends have been held relatively constant, but prices have climbed and share prices have climbed. I know in our case, uh, it wasn't that long ago, our yields were 2%. But we've delivered such a strong return on the shareholder uh, or on the share price that that's forced the dividend down. Now, obviously, people are building up their balance sheets, and and uh, and I would say the industry as a whole is trying to strengthen their balance sheets and get ready for the next phase of reinvestment into the industry. But as those balance sheets get stronger, then there's going to be a continued focus on the dividend side. I can tell you that right now, our dividend on a per share basis will climb because it is a unique dividend. It's a where right now, currently 30% of our cash flows go, goes towards our dividend as a, as a minimum. And cash flows, of course, are a function of commodity price. It is averaged over the previous four quarters, but commodity price and production growth. We see organic growth. We see higher commodity prices. There will be upward pressure on our dividend. And so uh, it wouldn't surprise me to see it increase over the next couple of quarters. And I can tell you that if we don't make any further investments into the ground, our debt will disappear in the first quarter of next year. And I, I assure you that by the end of next year, we will, if we haven't made any further investments, we will start looking at uh, returning even more of our cash back to our shareholders. I've already described most of this slide, but you can see it is uh, competitive. As our share prices have appreciated over the last uh, year and a bit, you can see the yields have dropped on a, on a per share basis. 
but we will see some growth uh, in this. Uh, currently, at the end of the second quarter, our dividend was 10 cents per share. We know that the higher commodity prices and the organic growth that we're seeing in the company will, will put upward pressure on that price, so stay tuned. Benefits to partner mining companies is really, there's a number of benefits as to why streaming is the best way for, for partner mining companies to finance operations. But the most important ones are the first two, or sorry, the, the second one and the third one. The arbitrage in value, especially with a base metals company, when you pluck precious metals out and bring it into our company, we actually gain in, in value and create that value. We share that arbitrage with the partners. It's unique in that it's truly a win-win situation where where our share price will go up on an announcement of a deal, and so will the partners. <laughs> Truly a win-win. The second one uh, is the improvement in project internal rate of return. The Slobo mine is an excellent example of this, where, where Vale spent $3.9 billion building this asset. We supplied $3.1 billion, or 78% of the capital. We only took away 17% of the revenue, and so so substantial improvement in the rate of return for the Valet shareholders on a go-forward basis. And you can see uh, you know, the benefits there uh, across the board. It's it, the dramatic improvement in project rate of return for, uh, for our partners. The real advantages for the partner streaming companies come from both that arbitrage and also from, uh, from uh, um, improving the internal rate of return on these projects. At Wheaton, ESG and, and community support is incredibly important. It's a core value, sustainability, making sure that we leave a positive uh, footprint behind us. And so we have four, four areas that we focus on. Of course, there's the due diligence stage. We're selective about what we invest into. We, we're not scared of, of areas that need support. In fact, we look at it as trying to be a change agent to try and, and strengthen our partners on this front. We have strong community investment programs. We've, we've got strong policies and practices in the company itself in terms of making sure we go forward. And now that we also really push external and voluntary commitments from all of our senior management and, and such. And so it's a good, strong uh, framework that we have within this company that, that I think makes us a leader in this space, definitely in the streaming space. Um, you know, the community investment program, we're the only streaming company that has a core portion of its revenue going back in, about one and a half percent of our, uh, uh, of our um, uh, free cash flow goes back to our, um, our uh, communities around us, you know, 0.5 percent of that actually goes to the communities where our employees live in, uh, in Vancouver, here, here in Vancouver, and also you know, our international offices. Uh, but one percent of it goes back to providing parallel support with our partners to try and improve sustainability initiatives and, and community benefits within uh, within the communities around the mine sites. Those those areas, there's four pillars that we focus on: health, education, environment, and community, and all sorts of examples of where we've been able to work with our partners to expand and improve. Um, health facilities, education facilities, uh, community infrastructure, uh, support uh, entrepreneurial programs to try and build long-term um, sustainable businesses. Um, we are also the, the only of the streaming and royalty companies to establish an additional $5 million, US $5 million CSR fund, Community Support and Relief Fund, in response to COVID-19. We in the precious metals industry have, have survived relatively well through this pandemic, whereas the rest of the world is 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 still uh, suffering, and so um, this has been put in place to provide additional frontline support to help uh, with the communities again uh, dealing with the impacts of uh, of of, of COVID nineteen and this pandemic. And so all of this, uh, along with a bunch of uh, increased uh, disclosure, um, you know, I think a lot of these things we had in place, but we've really amped up the amount of disclosure. We just published our first sustainability report, and it's uh, it's made Wheaton a top-rated uh, mining company uh, amongst the ESG analysts here, uh, ranked in A by MSCI, and Sustainalytics uh, ranked us as number one. We are carbon neutral. Um, we've committed to obviously the World, uh, World Gold Council's responsible gold mining principles, but we're also the first streaming company to commit to the UN Global Compact, which uh, actually has some higher standards in terms of uh, expectations. We're not striving to meet these, we're stri striving to exceed these. We think we already do, and it's a matter of just working our way forward, forward through this whole process. So very, very important aspect for us. 
And I will highlight that this is something that's also very important, more so within European investments, lots of interest in, in these programs from, from some of the funds that we've been talking to out of uh, London and, and out, of, uh, out of Europe. So why invest into uh, wheat and precious metals? Well, here's your traditional options. You could usually buy bullion or you could buy the mining companies. Now, obviously we've had our success has spawned other streaming companies. But I still say we differentiate ourselves from those other streamers by the fact that we're the only one that's pure precious metals production. Um, and we've got tax confidence and we have a very sustainable dividend policy where it's tied to our cash flows. Versus bullion and ETFs, uh, I mean, we provide all the upside of a traditional, our risk profile is very similar to bullion or an ETF. But uh, the fact that we have all the expiration upside, uh, we pay a dividend, uh, we actually have increased leverage. Um, there's so many reasons why we're much more attractive than a standard bullion and ETF, but our risk profile is very similar. And comparatively to the precious metal mining companies, as you can see, uh, the fact that our costs are fixed, that is usually the source of most disappointment with respect to investing into our precious metals, uh, our traditional mining company, is the cost risk that comes with that. And yet ours are all fixed, our capital costs are fixed by the contracts, and our operating costs are also fixed. So. Randy, just another question that was uh, submitted by an attendee. On the metal price forecasting, it was mentioned that there are optimal times to execute deals, but the exposure to the flat price risk can be harmful to metal streaming as much as for trading companies. How much can Wheaton hedge in its operations in order to mitigate that flat price risk and be more exposed to the spread risk? Um, well, we uh, we believe that our, our shareholders invest into us to get exposure to those precious metal prices. And so hedging is not something that we've entertained. Um, now, that being said, we do manage our sales program within any quarter to, to make sure that we optimize. One of the challenges that we saw with the silver market is it is so small and sometimes we get such large deliveries, we'd have an impact on the, on the price just by moving that silver into, in, uh, in, into selling that silver into the market. And so we have all sorts of uh, programs in place now to try and smooth out that impact over the period of a quarter, but we never carry a hedged amount over a quarter. To, to us, it's, it's the reason that shareholders invest into us is they want exposure to profitable precious metals production, but they also want exposure to those precious, precious metal prices. So hey, it's just, to clarify, just to clarify on that, when you take delivery of a metal, gold or silver, you don't speculate on where you think it's going in a month or three months or six months down the road, like you sell it right away. That's right. No, exactly. I, I hate to say it. I, I wish I could tell you what the price of gold was going to be tomorrow. I, my belief is that precious metal prices are going substantially higher, mainly because I, I have um, not, not, I don't have a lot of faith in the U S dollar, but I'm not going to risk my shareholders capital based on that belief. Uh, you know, when we make our investments, we make them so that we make a reasonable rate of return based on a flat price profile. And, uh, and, and as long as we can get a reasonable rate of return and the upside, the optionality of that precious metal exposure combined with the expiration and expansion potential that investing into good mines does generally deliver. Um, you know, to date we've averaged over 20% uh, after tax return to our shareholders. So, uh, uh, that's a pretty good track record of, uh, of, of you know, hedging our bets, so to speak, by, by making sure we invest into good assets, but, uh, but not playing any further games. As I mentioned, 100% um, uh, precious metals production. Our peers, generally Franco Nevada and Royal Gold, are the two companies that we are compared to. We actually generate more, uh, more revenue than Franco Nevada, and, and uh, uh, we are 100% precious metals production. 60% of that uh, comes from uh, gold. Another 30% plus comes from silver and a bit from palladium. Uh, palladium has actually been very good for us uh, as an investment, but, uh, but we are focused on precious metals. The mining companies represented by uh, Van Eck and the Philadelphia Gold and Silver Index, or just gold and silver. You can see uh, multi-year returns compared all the way across the board. We have outperformed consistently. The streaming model is the best way to invest into precious metals. And we feel at Wheaton that we have the collection of portfolio or collection of assets to deliver those returns. Just a quick question here. Recently, generalist investors have gotten a lot of attention by getting involved in the precious metals sector. For example, Berkshire Hathaway invested $500 million in Barrick 
and the Ohio Pension Fund also stated that they were going to allocate 5% of their $16 billion fund toward gold in some form. Are you getting a lot of calls from U.S. generalists? And it's one of the reasons that we like the London Stock Exchange is there's a large generalist segment there that doesn't have any options for low risk investing and, and high return. You know, the, the risk profile and the reward profile that we deliver is very unique. It's, it's kind of the best of both sides of the traditional uh, precious metals investing sphere. And, uh, and so I do think that we deliver that to, to these, especially to generalists. Um, by, by taking out the cost risk, it, it reduces the level of technical uh, uh, due diligence that's required at making a good investment because you know that uh, the costs are fixed uh, by the contract itself. And so, so you don't have that, that level of risk. So what we've done to date, uh, as of June 30th, we've invested over $9 billion into uh, into streams, um, but have already generated from that $9 billion, $6.9 billion in cash flow. And keep that in mind as, as we talk about the reserve and resource life that we've got going forward. We've already paid over a billion dollars back to our shareholders in the dividend, and we know that that's just going to continue to grow. We only started paying the dividend in 2012, and so um, you know we're going to see uh, incre increased return to shareholders over time. Strong annual cash flow. As I said, we're well over $200 million per quarter in, in cash flow right now. Uh, 40 years of reserves and measured and indicated resource life uh, um, forward. Inferred resources had another 25 plus years. Um, and as I said, 20% average annualized after-tax return from our portfolio. So a good strong track record in terms of what we've achieved. And uh, that's building us a very strong profile going forward where we've got great organic growth profile over the next while lots of uh, corporate development opportunities coming forward and um, yeah it's uh, <laughs> it looks very positive for us so this is the last slide that i was going to talk about uh, cost predictability i mean why why wheaton um, precious metals uh, is a good store of value it's uh, a you know it's widely becoming even more widely ex accepted that everyone should have at least 5 to 10% of their portfolio in precious metals just to protect themselves against the fiat currencies of the world uh, the challenges that we see the helicopter money that to, that is going to need to continue to be printed to to support economies around the world just bodes so well for precious metals and, uh, and so what we deliver, of course, is, is very profitable precious metals production. We have confident costs. We have uh, one of the highest quality asset bases, very strong, sustainable operations. Of course, you know, with this roast profile, we also deliver leverage and a healthy dividend that's, uh, that's paid to our, our shareholders. So we pay you to own our shares. Uh, and tax confidence. Um, you know, we've gone through and, and had full sign-off and agreement with the Canada Revenue Agency here, and so a good, strong business model that will continue to deliver superior returns to our shareholders uh, and excellent exposure to, I think, the best exposure possible to precious metals. We continue to strive to deliver more. Just in conclusion, you can just tell our attendees what we can expect in the coming weeks and months in terms of catalysts or news coming out of wheat and precious metals. Well, we're working, as, as I mentioned earlier on, working towards the LSE listing. Uh, we, you know, we announced the intent to list, but um, it's looking like it'll probably happen sometime within the next uh, uh, two, to, two to six weeks. Uh, it's, in the, it's in the regulator's hands, and so we're just waiting for some signals back, but hopefully sooner than later. Um, you know, we uh, we did give uh, some some guidance, uh, updated guidance at the end of the second quarter that had a production drop of about five percent over the year. But uh, so you know, obviously our third quarter results will be coming out in November. Uh, I think it's November 9th is when we release. Um, you know, uh, production looks good. We're we're very comfortable with where we are on uh, on 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 everything as a whole. We're seeing good, strong results from so many of our operations right now. Um, you know, from, from a pandemic uh, risk perspective, all of our partners are doing a really good job of managing that risk. Uh, mine sites do have a bit of an advantage in terms of being able to limit access and therefore limit risk uh, through some strong and strict controls. And so we've been fortunate from that perspective. Uh, we are constantly looking at new opportunities. Uh, this is an industry that needs capital. So I always like to describe it as, uh, you know, there's a bit of a wide spectrum. We can we could be fortunate enough to have a couple of billion dollar opportunities come into play over the next couple of, or next year or so. 
uh, or we could not make any acquisitions and uh, and um, pay off the debt by by the first quarter of next year and ultimately uh, increase the dividend even more from from where it will be um, you know currently so uh, that's those those are two pretty good scenarios um, you know these these are good times to be in the precious metals business it's good times to be invested in the precious metals and our portfolio is is humming right now and uh, and so you know we're constantly looking for ways to put the money back into the ground but if we can't then we'll give it back to shareholders well, that's great, Randy. I want to thank you very much. And to all the attendees, I want to thank you for taking the time to sign in. I know your time is valuable and we do appreciate it. If anybody would like to have a deeper discussion with Randy on Wheaton Precious Metals or another member of his team, let me know and I will arrange that. Once again, Randy, I want to thank you. Jimmy, always a pleasure. And uh, I hope at some time we can do this again face to face sometime soon.